this evening at the Tron. Hope you don't have to rush away afterwards. There'll be uh, refreshments here at the front and also downstairs in the foyer. Take the opportunity to stay, to greet one another, speak to somebody you don't know, encourage somebody, and uh, let's share fellowship in the Lord together. We're going to sing in a moment, but before we do, let me read some words from the prophet Isaiah, speaking some 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the teaching and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation and neither shall they learn war anymore. Well, that's the promise of God. And we're going to begin this evening by singing a version of those words. You'll find it at number 564 in our blue books. Behold, the mountain of the Lord in latter days shall rise.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, as we've read and as we've sung this great vision of a new world, a new world order, a world of righteousness and justice and peace is your promise. It is the sure and certain purpose of all of your plans of salvation from the very beginning, indeed, from before the very foundation of this world, that this whole universe should be filled with your glory and with knowledge of you and that people from every land, every tribe and language and nation should be brought together as one, as your seed, as the offspring of Abraham, as the inheritors of your great and gracious promises. And this world will be filled with praise, with joy, with gladness, with all the fulfillment of things that we have dreamt of and longed for but have never yet seen because, because this world is so spoiled, so disfigured, and so misshapen because of all that comes out of the hearts of human beings. And yet, Lord, we have your promise certainly. We've seen already in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ when he walked this earth, we've seen the joy and the gladness and the healing breaking forth, becoming visible before the witnesses, the eyes of countless thousands of people seeing the wounded healed, even the dead raised, the broken, having their lives once again restored, put together. And all of this, Lord, is but a foretaste, but a glimpse of what you have promised shall be forever and ever. And so, Lord, as we, your people, long for that day, and how, how can we but long all the more as we read and sing of these things? As we long for that day, our prayer is that you would help us, along with all your people the world over, to speed its coming as we take upon ourselves the mantle, the great mission, the commission that you have given to us as your church to go into every nation and make disciples, proclaiming the gospel of our Lord Jesus, risen and ascended, and calling people to repent, to bow down, and to love and to follow him. So, Lord, we pray that as we think of these things this evening, as we are reminded of the unstoppable force of your gospel, that word going out in the beginning from Jerusalem, beginning its journey to the very uttermost parts of this earth, that you would spur on our hearts to play our part. We pray very especially tonight, Lord, for some of our missionary partners serving you in other parts of the world and reminding us that this whole earth is yours. We pray for the Murray family soon to be back with us here, coming back from Thailand. And once again, Lord, we pray very especially for the visa application for Knock. We ask that you would speed its processing through the British Home Office or wherever it is that it might even be possible for her to come with Scott and the children, that together they might uh, be able to come and join us with rejoicing. We ask also for Roy Murray as he returns soon from South America and will rejoice in being not only with us but with his brother for a prolonged period. We thank you, Lord, for that happy reunion about to happen. And we ask that these times in the coming months, as they do home assignment here, would be ones of great blessing. But even as they come home, we pray for the land of Thailand, so much in the news with the extraordinary rescue of these boys from the cave. And yet, Lord, a land so greatly in need of the gospel of Christ, as is every land in this world. We pray for your church there, for many of our loved ones there. 
We pray also, Lord, for other parts of Southeast Asia, remembering Sam and Ruth Lee and the family back also on home assignment in this country and in Holland. We pray for them, that you would refresh them and encourage them and bless them and send them back to their ministries filled with confidence and with the hope of your gospel of grace. We think of the Roberies, Lord, asking that you'd be with them this week as they uh, enjoy time of fellowship down at the Keswick Convention. Pray for them as they uh, speak on Thursday evening and are interviewed as part of the missionary program. We ask that you'd give them just the right words to convey not only the work that they're involved in in Nigeria, but also to bring a challenge and an encouragement and a vision to many who will be listening to them to bring the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ continually to the very ends of the earth. We think of the land of Pakistan and our dear brother Imran Gill and his wife and family. Thanking you, Lord, for our partnership with them, praying for their blessing, indeed for their protection as they make Jesus Christ known in a land that sometimes has been so very hostile and so dangerous even for the messengers of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for their house, which is steadily being built, and we ask that that building, and indeed its completion soon, would be a great encouragement for our brother there, and for Nagina especially, and for the whole family, and that you would use it to help them as they seek to serve you. Lord, we have so many partners throughout the world and throughout this nation. How thankful we are to be part of what you are doing the world over. Because ultimately, that will be the only thing that has really mattered about the whole history of this planet. We praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are Lord, not only of this earth, but Lord of heaven, Lord of all worlds. And we ask that tonight, as we listen to your word, you would fill us again with confidence and hope in your saving gospel. So hear us, Lord. Draw near to us, we pray. Inhabit our prayers. Speak to our hearts. And send us on our way to love you and to serve you all the more for the sake of your great love for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again the hymn on the screens before I hand over to Paul and uh, go off down to the Farsi service. O God of our fathers, creator and Lord.
Well, we turn out to our reading, and in the book of Acts, so Acts chapter 10, and uh, you'll find that on page 918, uh, 918, if using one of the church uh, visitor Bibles. Acts chapter 10, and uh, we're reading from verse 1, picking up the story with Peter. Last week, he was... healing Aeneas and Dorcas, and we pick up the story. He's been staying with Simon the Tanner. We read that in verse 43 of chapter 9, and we pick up the story in chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter, He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, The men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. 
So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We turn again to our hymn books and we sing uh, hymn number 574. This is a key moment of the life of the church. The barriers are knocked down. And so we sing, one holy apostolic church, the body of the Lord, our task to witness to his name in full and glad accord, number 574.
uh, offering will be uplifted, and uh, as that's happening, the musicians will play for us. Uh, perhaps in the quiet, you might just want to remember folk, particularly in prayer, folk that you know are in need, uh, do be praying for them. But uh, the offering will now be uplifted. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you give us so abundantly, our daily bread, our every breath, our friends, our family, this church, and supremely in Christ, forgiveness for sin and everlasting life. And because you have first given, we give these small gifts, as well as our time, our talents, for the work of your church. So use them for the furtherance of your gospel to the ends of the earth. What a privilege we have to have a role in that work, a work that will be brought to completion because you're in control and you are the sovereign Lord. And so we pray for ourselves tonight as we have listened to your word, as we hear your word preached, and we ask that what we know not would you teach us, what we are not would you make us, and what we have not would you give us? We ask this for your glory and for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we sing the hymn on the screens now. In reverence and awe, we gather round your words.
Please do uh, turn back to Acts chapter 10. Give you a moment to do that. Acts chapter 10, uh, the chapter we uh, read earlier. Now, this passage is the answer to a question that you and I don't really ask. For us, the answer seems so obvious. The question seems to us to be a moot one, but it certainly wasn't at the time. The question is, is the gospel really for everyone? And more specifically, is the gospel for the Gentile as well as the Jew? And the answer this passage gives is emphatically yes. In this passage, a major, major barrier to the spread of the gospel is dismantled. The age-old but always temporary wall between Jew and Gentile is brought crashing down. This really is a monumental passage and the implications of which you and I perhaps take for granted. But without the events of these verses, if this didn't happen, then human history would look very different indeed. Most of us wouldn't be here. Chapter 10 of Acts is the key movement, the key moment in the movement of the unstoppable gospel as it continues its spread according to Jesus' agenda that he set back there in chapter 1, verse 8 of the book. Now, the gospel has, by this point in the book, been well established in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria. We've seen that in recent chapters. But now, as a result of what we read earlier, the gospel really starts to make inroads to the Gentile world. The gospel proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And we learn in this passage that the barriers that have been permanently removed, we learn that it's the very same gospel that's preached to Gentiles that was preached to the Jews. And we learn that there is only one people of God. These are major lessons, major lessons for Theophilus, who first read this to learn, and things for us to grapple with. So we'll look at it in three sections. We'll look at firstly verses 1 to 33, God's gospel servant prepared. And we learn in this section that the barriers have been permanently removed. Now by the end of this section, verse 33, we have Peter in Cornelius' house, where he's been invited to share with those gathered. He's been invited to share the gospel. And Peter is willing to do it. That is a major barrier that has been overcome. Peter has now come to understand that the barrier between Jew and Gentile has now been permanently removed. And we see all this through two key individuals. Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile, and Peter the apostle, and both go through something of a transformation, a conversion, 
to some degree. Cornelius, although he's a good man, he's not a saved man at the start of this chapter. But by God's grace, as he hears the gospel proclaimed, he responds in repentance and he's baptized. And Peter, likewise, goes through something of a journey. His understanding at the outset is that there is a clear distinction between Jew and Gentile. His understanding was that it was not permissible for Jews to mix with Gentiles. And so he perceived a major barrier in terms of who he is able to bring the gospel to. But through this chapter, his understanding is totally turned on its head. And so we see in this opening section that God is preparing his gospel servant for this huge step forward in the progress of the gospel. So let's look at this. We see in verse 1 to 8, we're introduced to Cornelius. He lived, as we see there in Caesarea, which was the center of the Roman administration in the province of Judea. And it was largely a Gentile city. And Cornelius was a Gentile himself. He was serving in the army. And he was a thoroughly good man. Look at how Luke describes him. He was a devout man who feared God. He was generous. He prayed. He was a seeker, much like the Ethiopian eunuch that we met a couple of chapters ago, but not yet saved. But the Lord intervenes and begins to orchestrate events to bring about the pivotal encounter with Peter later in the chapter. In a vision, an angel of the Lord came and spoke with Cornelius and told him to send for the Apostle Peter, who was staying in Joppa. But the question in the back of our minds is, would Peter be willing to go? Would Peter be willing to go to this Gentile household? But for the intervention of the Lord, he wouldn't have gone. He acknowledges as much himself, doesn't he? Look down with me at verse 28, where Peter is addressing Cornelius and those gathered in his home. This is what he says. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. It's a major problem, isn't it, identified by Peter. But look on to what he says next. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. So there would have been strong reasons for Peter to decline the invitation from Cornelius, but he didn't. The Lord showed him that it was now okay for him to go and visit with a Gentile. Now what had happened to Peter? What had the Lord shown him that such a major change in thinking had occurred? It's a big barrier, isn't it? Just imagine yourself in Peter's shoes. For your whole life, you've known it is not okay to go and sit with Gentiles and eat with them. That is a major barrier to overcome, isn't it? But here he is, he's willing to go. What has happened? Well, let's look on to verse 9 and following. Cornelius has sent these three men to go and bring Peter, and as they're en route, Peter himself sees a vision. And in the vision, he sees this great sheet descending from the heavens, and in the sheet were all kinds of animals. And Peter is then given the instruction, rise, kill, and eat. But Peter objects. He says, no, I can't kill and eat these animals. I've never eaten anything unclean or common in my life. Peter's concern here is that he remains holy. And his understanding Peter's understanding is rooted in the scriptures that he had been brought up with. And so when the Lord speaks to him, he doesn't rebuke him, but he does press home the implications of the words and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in him, in Jesus, all the Old Testament laws to do with food, they find their fulfillment. Things have now changed. And so the voice came to Peter again. Look at verse 15. What God has made clean, do not call common. What God has made clean, do not call common. The barrier 
that once have been put in place by the law between foods deemed clean and unclean has now been removed. Three times Peter has given this vision, and the implications begin to fall into place for Peter. Yes, the Lord had, for a time, put in place the good but temporary laws to do with food. What were they there for? Well, they were there to remind God's people that they were holy. They were set apart. They were different because they were God's people. And these laws were there to protect them, to protect them from the false religions of the Gentile world, to protect them from the Gentile nations around them. Now, there was, of course, nothing wrong with the food itself. Jesus says as much, doesn't he, in uh, Mark chapter 7. Listen to what Jesus says. Nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean. It is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. But the Lord had given his people these laws to help them be a nation set apart and holy and not like the nations around them. And so that made mixing with the Gentiles quite difficult, didn't it? If there were all sorts of food they couldn't eat, God had effectively built a wall between Israel and all the Gentiles. But it was this wall that Peter now understood to be dismantled. That barrier that the Lord had erected had been brought down. David Gooding helpfully explains, he says this, as an Israelite, Peter regarded himself by definition as holy because he was a member of the holy nation and because he kept the ceremonial food laws. Gentiles, on the other hand, he understood to be common because they were not members of the holy nation. He regarded them as unclean. And it was that situation that Peter now understood to have been changed. If God cancelled all those prohibitions on food and pronounced all foods clean, then Gentiles were no longer unclean because they ate certain foods that had changed. So if God was now doing away with Israel's special privilege, destroying that wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, then the Gentiles were no longer common by definition, nor the Israelites holy by definition. Jew and Gentile now stood alike on the same platform. It had all slowly but surely clicked into place for Peter. The Lord is showing him the implications of the work of Jesus. All that Jesus came to do and fulfill, the Lord is helping Peter to understand. And so he now knows He's able to say that he should not regard any category of persons as common or unclean. He was therefore free to visit with those from a Gentile nation. He was free to visit with Cornelius, to eat with him, and ultimately to share the gospel with him. So what makes somebody clean or holy? It isn't what food they eat but rather it's their attitude towards the living God. Do they listen to him? Do they submit to him? And by faith, do they walk with him? Whether they're Jew or Gentile, that is the thing that matters. And this, as we've seen, is a major moment of breakthrough. It's so big in Luke's understanding that he repeats this account three times. Here, again in chapter 11, and then again in chapter 15. It is a monumental, groundbreaking, foundational shift in understanding to grasp that the barriers that have been permanently removed, to know that there was no distinction between Jew and Gentile, to then take the gospel to the Gentiles, that is huge. That is a big, big moment in the book of Acts. And we perhaps today take that for granted. It takes quite a bit of thought to think yourself into Peter's shoes, doesn't it? We understand instinctively that the gospel's for the Gentiles. Most of us here, I would think, are Gentile in origin. Most of us have Gentile roots. So this was a big shift in understanding for Peter and for the apostles. And so we need to remember We need to remember the fundamental lesson that the Lord was teaching Peter here. 
You see, the Lord, he doesn't make a distinction. He doesn't make a distinction between certain classes or categories of people. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All need salvation. And we are to go to all nationalities, all classes, all sorts of people, and share with them the gospel. There is no distinction. And so, although at first glance we may think this doesn't really apply to us because, well, we understand that the gospel's for all, but do we really have categories in our own thinking? Are there particular groups of people that we perhaps write off? People that we wouldn't go to? Places we wouldn't visit? Are there certain folk that we would unwittingly deem unclean? Or to put it another way, are there certain people we have so clearly fixed in our evangelistic sites that we miss others? Are we so focused on one group that we miss others? Do we miss the unexpected sort of folk, the people who are eager to hear the gospel? who, like Cornelius, are searching and ready to respond. You see, Cornelius is so eager, isn't he? He's searching, he's looking, he's inviting Peter, he brings all his friends and relatives to come and hear. So we, too, are to be on the lookout for the eager, no matter what class or category of person they might be. We're to look for the hungry. And they may not be the sorts of people that we would naturally want to sit down with and share the gospel with. I don't suppose that Peter was initially all that comfortable with the Lord asking him to do this. But he did it. He was willing to go. Once his understanding had been shifted, he was able to set aside those prejudices, set that lifetime of understanding aside, and go to Cornelius' house to meet with him, to eat with him to share the gospel with them. And so it's a challenge in terms of thinking, who do we reach out to with the gospel? Are there certain categories we've unwittingly ruled out? But it's a challenge not just in terms of who we want to reach out to, but also how we view ourselves. Peter came to understand that certain categories of people weren't just by belonging to that category, somehow automatically saved. He knew that because he was a Jew, didn't automatically make him one of the Lord's people. He understood now that Jew and Gentile were on the same level. There is no room for boasting or pride. And for us today, just subscribing to a certain label, it counts for nothing. Just referring to yourself under the label of Reformed Presbyterian, or evangelical, or sound. That doesn't count for anything. Because all people, in all places, must come. In order to be welcomed into the family of God, they must come to the same place. They all must come to the foot of the cross, because all of us, by our nature, are sinners in need of a Savior. All of us need to be forgiven on the same terms. Faith in Jesus Christ, who died for our sin and rose again. And that leaves nothing for us to boast in, but only everything to rejoice in together. All of us are on the same footing on our own terms, aren't we? We all need the grace that is found only in Jesus. Well, there's the first thing, and it is a massive step. God's gospel servant is prepared. He comes to learn that the barriers between Jew and Gentile are now removed. He can go to the Gentiles and sit with them and eat with them. And then let's look on then to what happens as Peter speaks with Cornelius and his household. So look on to verse 34 to 43. God's gospel sermon is preached. And we learn here it's the very same gospel that was preached to the Jews. Peter begins by reiterating the understanding he's now come to. Look at verses uh, 34 and 35. He says, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So he's just reiterating what he's come to understand. God shows no partiality. 
And he knows that although God had given the people of Israel a special and a distinct role, it was always his intention that through Israel all the nations will be blessed. It's just as Willie was reading at the very start from Isaiah. That great day when all nations would be gathered to the Lord's mountain, that was always in view. And Peter has clearly grasped this. He knows that God doesn't show any favoritism. The gospel is for all people and all nations. And so it is the very same gospel message that Peter proclaims to Cornelius and all those he's gathered around in his home. It's the same gospel. It's a message of good news through peace found only in Jesus Christ. Look at what he says here. Look at what he tells the people there. He talks about Jesus, who has been anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. He went about doing good and healing in the country of the Jews in, in Jerusalem. But staggeringly, the Jews put Jesus to death. But God raised him. Peter says, many of us are witness of this. We ate with him after the fact. And he commanded us to go and preach to the people to testify that he is the one appointed to be judged and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So Peter, he preaches the very same gospel that he's preached everywhere he's been so far. It's the same gospel that he preached to the Jews. Just listen to the conclusion of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2. Here's what he said then. He says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And look what he says here in chapter 10, verse 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Same gospel. Same call to repent. And the gospel, it remains the same no matter who you're speaking to, no matter where you are. And Peter had immediately grasped that, hadn't he? Once he understood that God had removed the old barrier between Jew and Gentile, once he understood that God shows no partiality, he understood that all must hear the same gospel about the Lord Jesus Christ, about his life, his death, his resurrection. Because he is Lord of all. Jesus Christ, Lord of all, not just the Jews, but all. And the gospel that you and I are to take to the people we know is the very same gospel that Peter took to Cornelius. It was the gospel message that Cornelius needed to hear and to respond to. Yes, Cornelius was undoubtedly a good man. He was a seeker. But he still needed to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and be forgiven. And Cornelius knew that. He knew that despite all that he had and all that he was, he knew that more than anything, he needed salvation that was found only in Jesus. And so he repented. He acknowledged his sin. He sought forgiveness in the abundant mercy of God. And he found life. Cornelius found life, abundant life. And so you and I, we can't allow our judgments of other people to cloud our perception of their fundamental needs. I imagine if I had met Cornelius, I would have thought, yeah, you're a good guy. Just crack on as you are. But no, he needed to hear the gospel. And so if you and I, the nicest person you know, if they haven't received Christ as their savior, they need to. If Cornelius did, a man who enjoyed a stellar reputation, who was generous, even religious, then they must too. But we also can't allow our self-perception to be clouded either. We need to see ourselves through the lens of Peter's gospel, which is Paul's gospel, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only gospel with real hope because it's the only gospel that deals with our real problem. It's the only gospel that really grapples with the reality of the human condition. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. All must find forgiveness in Jesus' name. All of us, no matter our reputation, our status, 
We need our sins forgiven in Jesus Christ if we're to belong to God's family and enjoy life everlasting. That is the only way everlasting. That is the only way. That is the only way. The only way. So be sure. So be sure. So be sure. This evening. Be sure that you're clear on that. Be sure tonight that you are clear on the gospel. If you're not clear, then you need to get clear. This very evening, speak to someone. Speak to me. Speak to the person next to you. If you've not responded to the call of the gospel in Jesus Christ, then you must. The gospel in Jesus Christ, then you must. Christ, then you must. It's what, it's what Cornelius did. And it's what I must urge you to do. And it's what I must urge you to do tonight as well. It's what I must urge you to do tonight as well. And it is a gospel. And it is a gospel as we see that Cornelius, as we see that Cornelius gladly accepts. Gladly accepts. That's accepts. That's clear from the final section. It's the same gospel that's proclaimed. It's the same gospel that's proclaimed. And it's just proclaimed. And it's the same spirit that is poured out. Same spirit that is poured out. Verses that is poured out. Verses 44 to 48. God's gospel, God's gospel spirit is poured out. We learn that there is, we learn that there is one, that there is one people, that there is one people of God. People of God. Look there at verse. Look there at verse 44. There at verse 44. While Peter was still saying all these things, the still saying all these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. The Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Fell on all who heard the word. And the word. And the believers. And the believers. From, and the believers. From among the circumstances. For among the circumcised who had, for among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on poured out even on the Gentiles, on the Gentiles. You see, God. You see, God is doing just. You see, God is doing just what He said He would do. And he would do. And those with Peter, they're amazed as they see. They're amazed as they see this happening. See this happening. The Lord. The Lord has made clear to Peter that the Lord has made clear to Peter that the old barriers are now dismantled. He was now free to sit with them. To, he was now free to sit with them to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, and he's gospel to the Gentiles, and he's just done that. He has said to them just what he said to the Jews and said to them just what he said to the Jews in Jerusalem. He's made the Jews in Jerusalem. He's made the same appeal to them. He's made the same appeal to repent and to be forgiven. Same appeal to repent and to be forgiven of sin. And God now pours out and God now pours out on these Gentiles the same Holy Spirit that he the same Holy Spirit that he poured out a pain, Holy Spirit that he poured out of Pentecost on the Jews. The same Holy Spirit that he used. The same Holy Spirit that he poured out on the half spirit that he poured out on the half Jews, the Samaritans in chapter eight. The very same gift of the Spirit. The very same gift of the Spirit. And so the point is clear. And so the point is clear. There is now there is now only one people of God. Now only one people of God. No distinction people of God. No distinction. No barriers, no categories, no barriers, no categories, just one people of God. And so, and so God proves, doesn't he? And so God proves, doesn't he, without doubt, doesn't he, without doubt, that there is one people of God. The barriers have been removed. Jesus has welcomed. Jesus has welcomed these Gentiles into the family of God on the into the family of God on the basis not of the basis 
not of their background, but on their background, but on their response to his but on their response to his word, their, on their response to his word, their response of faith, their response of faith. That is, that is, that is, that is the only thing that matters. And so it's clear, isn't it, as we read this? So it's clear, isn't it, as we read this? God makes no distinction. God makes no distinction. Distinction. All need, all need to submit to Jesus. Need to submit to Jesus. All need to believe in him. All need to believe in him. To receive forgiveness. Believe in him. To receive forgiveness of sins. And all that do, and all that do, all that do, all that respond in all that respond in faith, trusting in Jesus, respond in faith, trusting in Jesus, they will be Jesus. They will be welcomed in. They will be given the gift. Welcomed in. They will be given the gift of the Spirit in them. Spirit in them. And so for each of us and so for each of us here tonight tonight the question is have you heard have you responded have you responded to the call of Jesus in the gospel to the call of Jesus in the gospel Jesus in the gospel he calls all people everywhere he makes no distinction no person no group no group of people, no type, no group of people, no type of personality, no colour of skin is beyond reality, no colour of skin is beyond the reach of the gospel. Of skin is beyond the reach of the gospel. There is no distinction. Nothing, nothing holds anyone back from knowing holds anyone back from knowing Jesus anyone back from knowing Jesus and the forgiveness of, back from knowing Jesus and the forgiveness of sins not Jesus and the forgiveness of sins nothing is stopping anyone apart from their apart from their own refusal to repent their own refusal to repent and turn to him that is the only bar- and turn to him that is the only barrier to him that is the only barrier the only barrier, our own, pr- our own pride, our own fruit refusal to recognize pride, our own fruit refusal to recognize what God makes plain, that we're sinners in need of salvation, sinners in need of salvation, salvation. You see the great, you see the great, encu- you see the great. Encouragement from this passage is that all from this passage is that all who respond to that call, all who respond to that call, to that call, all will be glad. All will be gladly accepted. All will be gladly accepted. That's the accepted. That's the wonderful news of. That's the wonderful news of the heart of this. Pa- that's the wonderful news of the heart of this passage. Even the Gentiles. Even Cornelius and those, even Cornelius and those gathered, and many, many millions of Gentiles since. Many millions of Gentiles since. That is the great joyful note of this passage, the gospel passage. The gospel is exploding out from the gospel is exploding out from Jerusalem, exploding out from Jerusalem, from Judea, from Samaria to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth. It's going. Gone, we've seen that over the gone, we've seen that over the centuries. Over the centuries. So have you. So have you accepted. 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 Is your voice. Is your voice alongside many millions of alongside many millions of others? Millions of others. But do you also, do you tell others of this same others, of this same gospel? Gospel. Those you rub shoulders with, those you rub shoulders with, those you rub shoulders with, no matter who they are with, no matter who they are, no matter who they are, who they are, no matter their background, their lifestyle, 
background, their lifestyle. Nothing prevents them from hearing the gospel, prevents them from hearing the gospel, because there is no barrier. There is no barrier. There is only one gospel. There is, there is only one gospel. There is only one, one gospel. There is only one people of God. People of God. And he delights to welcome into his family all. His family all. All are welcome. And that is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And that is a wonderful thing, isn't it? To God, isn't it? To God be the glory. Great things he's done. Great things he is doing. And great things doing. And great things he will yet do. And great things he will yet do as his gospel goes. As his gospel goes to the ends of the earth. Let's to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Earth. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your words, your words. We thank you for the implications of this passage, which we so often implications of this passage, which we so often take for granted, which we so often take for granted. What an extraordinary thing for Peter to say. Truly, I un- say. Truly, I understand that God. I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every shows no partiality, but in every nation, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him, anyone who fears Him, and does what is right, is acceptable to Him. To Him. So Father, give us. So Father, give us voice to. Rejoice. So, Father, give us voice to rejoice in that. Give us voice to rejoice in that truth. You show no partiality. You show no partiality. But all who call upon your name, all who call upon your name, will be welcomed. And so, Lord, do you help us to be a people? And so, Lord, do you help us to be a people that rejoice to bring that gospel to the nations? Gospel to the nations. That we would be a people, that we would be a people that make no distinction. Help us, Lord, in that task. In that task. How quickly we write people off. How quickly we write people off. How quickly we write people off. How quickly we look to those who we look to those who we think will be those who we think will be receptive. Lord, open up will be receptive. Lord, open our eyes to the eager. Open our eyes to the hungry. Open our eyes to the hungry. And may we be willing vessels to the hungry. And may we be willing vessels with your gospel. With your gospel. For we ask it in Jesus. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we close our time together by singing uh, hymn number six hundred and seventy. Uh, hymn number six hundred and seventy-six. Six hundred and seventy-six. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great God be the glory. Great things He has done. So loved He the world. Done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. Number six seven. Us, his Son. Number six seven six.
grace of the Lord Jesus by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen.